One of the most important principles of biblical interpretation is to keep in mind the context of what you're trying to interpret. There is a wise adage that says, a text without a context is a pretext. But grammatical context is not the only context we need to be aware of. There is also cultural context, historical context, geographical context, among others. For a fascinating discussion of biblical context as it relates to the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have one of our favorite guests with us today, back for the third time, is Doug Greenwald. He is a down-to-earth Bible scholar who serves as the Senior Teaching Fellow for a ministry called Preserving Bible Times. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy, Doug. Thank you, David. It's a delight to be back here and to have another opportunity to dig deeply into God's well, Word. Well, thank you. You're always a blessing when you come. Definitely, definitely. Well, Doug, it's great to have you back. Your website, we were joking that if in real estate it's location, location, location. <laughs> your website is context, context, context. That seems to be the foundation of your ministry. So, if you could briefly tell folks what your ministry is about and why context is so important. Meaning, meaning, meaning. Meaning, meaning, meaning. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's all about original meaning of the passage. Okay. Why does that matter? Because that's where the transformational power of a passage is to be found. And so, what we're about, about preserving Bible times, is bringing context, how the original people who heard those words and observed these events mm -hmm. would have understood them. And to get out of our Western mindset and to engage those passages, to have the Bible come alive by bringing the various contextual pieces to bear. And then when the Bible comes alive, no longer are we like passive participants and observers. We actually place ourselves into the passage. And that's when transformation starts to occur. So, simply stated, context allows the Bible to become alive. And when the Bible becomes alive, God's people thrive. So, you fill in the blanks for us, something that's lost in the translation of history, time, and trans, uh, interpretation. Exactly. It's helpful to, okay. to look at it this way. The biblical writers always assumed their readers lived when, where, and how they did. Logically. So, they assumed mm -hmm. you just do a lot of things. They had no need to put them in the passage. Sure. Okay. They just assumed you knew. Well, in some passages, 90% of what they thought we would know is now missing. Mm -hmm. We have to put that back in place. It's called contextual restoration. It's what makes the Bible come alive in three dimensions. I think the average person here in the Western world just does not have any concept of how much they miss by not knowing the culture in which this was written. They just don't understand how people live then and the parables of Jesus are based upon the life then. Exactly. Remember Ken Burns' yes. PBS special yes. of the National Parks? How would you care to watch that? On 60 inch full color plasma TV or a 1955 black and white Zenith TV. Okay? Right. Right. The text is the same, the narrative is the same, but what you see and appreciate is so well, much. Well, that's different. exactly what I tell people about going to Israel on one of our pilgrimages is that it turns the Bible from black and white into technicolor. You, 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 no longer is Capernaum a, a, a word on a page. It's a place you've been, you've seen it, you've smelled it, you, you experienced it, and you have some idea of really where it is. So, it's, it's context is so important. I heard something the other day that really caught my fancy. It sort of went like this. The Bible, without putting it back into its original context, is like listening to Bach being played on a harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> that bad. Okay, wow. with that we're going to take a break and come back and apply context to one of the best known stories in the Bible, Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion with Doug Greenwald about the importance of biblical context. Doug, let's take that biblical context into the Christmas story of Luke 2. I want to read uh, the first three verses to you, and maybe you can explain something that's always puzzled me. Uh, Luke 2 1 says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. 
First, what is a census and why did people have to go to the cities rather than just door-to-door -door census people? Why didn't they just send a, send a census taker by and knock on the door? Yeah. I, what's <laughs> or that send about? carrier pigeons to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. And, and Luke would assume that we would understand what a sure. census means. Yeah. Okay? First observation here, the reference to Caesar Augustus, this is history. This is a real story. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we say it's the Christmas story. Yeah, but it's also a real history, okay? And then that mention of Caesar Augustus reminds us of that. The first emperor who created census because he wanted to create a systematic taxation. He's the first emperor who wants to now fund the Roman legion. So this is one of his reasons. So it's a fundraiser. Yeah, so to speak. And he also wants to figure out where to spend the public works money in the kingdom, in the empire. So you got to know where the biggest concentrations of people are. Now, what we learned on our trips to Italy to study Paul's Roman world is that Rome systematically had a census every five years. Hmm. Okay. And because they wanted to maximize participation, they allowed, and there's some debate here, whether it's 12 months or 24 months for the census to be completed. This notion that we have of we all vote on the first Tuesday in November and everybody shows up at one place at one time, not the way it works. Okay? Okay. Are you seeing a myth starting to evaporate already about no room in the end because so many people showed up, you know? That's not the way it worked. And Luke would assume that we would know that. Now, here's another thing. The reason you have to go to the city of your clan is only if you own property there. This is an asset tax, okay? okay? And that raises a fascinating question. Why is Joseph, who's part of the clan of David, own land around Bethlehem, why is he living 290 miles north in Nazareth? Luke would expect us to be struck by that. Well, what about it? <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting it here in anticipation. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't have a precise answer, but here's two good ones, okay? okay. Joseph and I suspect his father, were tradesmen, not just carpenters. They were primarily stonemasons. If you've been in Israel, everything's made out of stone. Hmm. Um, and so you have Herod the Great in the south there who keeps conscripting tradespeople to do these massive building projects. A lot of people, particularly from Bethlehem area, hate Herod the Great. And it may be that Joseph's father or grandfather went north to Nazareth because then Herod the Great cannot get you. You're in the region of Herod Antipas. That's one thought. Second thought, and maybe these do come together here, is that there's a whole group of Jews who are, we'll call them Messianic Jews. They're fascinated with Messiah. They want to be where Messiah is going to be shown first. And the rabbis have taken that Isaiah 9 prophecy about the light will shine in Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun is the tribal allotment where Nazareth is found. Naphtali is the tribal allotment where Capernaum is found. Okay. And so there may be another reason. We want to be where Messiah is going to be seen first in the eyes of the rabbis, and so they relocated. Huh? Those are two possible reasons. Okay, well, let's move on. I want to get as much of this covered as we can. Yeah, definitely. So wow. let's pick up with verse 4. He went to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was the house and line of David. Now that reminds us of something. If he's of the house and lineage of David, when we read in the Mishnah, which is the oral codification of the Jewish oral tradition, which was put down in 200 AD, we learn a lot of things, including that the clan of David is required to, is mandated to do the support for the wood offering in the temple in the month of July. So year after year, after a certain age, for maybe 14, Joseph's coming down to Bethlehem to be part of the Davidic wood offering in the month of July. And on one of those trips, he says, oh, do I have good news? I am betrothed to a wonderful young lady named Miriam, Mary. Okay. That raises another question. Oh, what boy, does it ever. Yeah. Does it ever. Okay. It starts to set the stage because he was the house and family line of David. Now, let's pause there. In this culture, hospitality is mandatory, okay? And obviously hospitality is mandatory to your own clan. So we're gonna factor that in here in just a moment. He went to be registered with Mary, who was betrothed in marriage to him. We gotta understand betrothal. It's different than how we see engagements. To, to Quite a bit. Okay. First, it starts out by it's a brokered marriage between families. 
They didn't choose each other. Exactly. Their parents did. Okay. And then you go to a scribe and you write what's known as a ketubah, which is a marriage contract. Okay? Lays out the terms and conditions of the dowry and what happens if things go south and what have you. Okay? At that moment in time, they are considered to be legally married, but not socially married. Hmm. When the betrothal is done, and there's a little ceremony there, which is almost like a miniature communion, and then the bride goes into seclusion. And the bridegroom was never going to see her until the day of the wedding. And basically, we're waiting for the woman, the young lady, to start menstruating because the purpose of a woman is to procreate in this culture, okay? So we're talking 13-year-old brides. Typically, the man is 18-year-old and the young woman is 13. All right, so we're talking Typically. teenagers in this story. Typically, okay. if this follows the form here, all right? Okay. Point being that once the betrothal contract is signed, Joseph and Mary will have no contact. So the fact that she becomes pregnant in the eyes of this culture is um, two things. It's either adultery or it's promiscuity. Hmm. That's what the clan in Bethlehem is going to be thinking when we get there, okay? So we got to understand that backdrop here. Who was expecting a child. Now, in verse 6, while they were there. We don't know how long Mary and Joseph have been in Bethlehem. That's Two a days. Good point because you see these Christmas specials and they're riding in on a donkey that night and she's ready to give birth. But you're saying from that verse, it could have been they were there days, weeks, or months, or even months. Oh, yes. Okay. You know, we have this mythology that they got there at 10 o'clock at night and all the rooms were filled and Tom Burdett forgot to leave the light on for them, you know, in <laughs> Motel 6. <laughs> And therefore, there's no room in the end. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. That's okay? true. That's true. I always miss over that little bit of verse there that they had been there already for a while. And there it is in black and white, and yeah. it's like we've oh. never seen it before. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her birth firstborn son and wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. Now, the word manger is going to be a very important word to us because it's going to help the shepherds realize they can complete the task that they've been given. Only the poorest of the poor, the most marginalized of people, would ever put a newborn baby in a manger. It's a feeding trough for animals. Well, how did they even get to a place where there was a manger? Why was there no room for them in an inn? Great setup. That's where, exactly where we're going next. Okay. Because in this verse, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now we're talking, uh, like you said, Motel 6. I mean, lots of rooms, big building? Negative. No, okay. The underlying word here is kataluma. It means guest room. When Jesus uses the word in in another setting, the Good Samaritan, it's a very different Greek word, almost like caravanasie, okay? Hmm. It's where the caravanners stay. Oh, more They're like inns a, on major trade routes, okay? Like a trailer park kind of where everyone parks their camel and exactly. gets together. Exactly. Okay. But they're really tough environments. It's almost like being in a biker bar. Okay? <laughs> no man is ever going to take his wife about to give birth into one of those inns. Okay? okay. A different inn. A Cataluma. Totally different inn. Okay. Cataluma is not an inn and all. It's a guest room. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we have to now understand how homes were constructed in the first century. 90% of the people in the first century are living in a one-room home. Mm -hmm. The footprint may be 12 foot by 15 foot. Wow. The 12 by 12 foot of it is the one room, everything room. Then there's an interesting divider wall here. It's a, it's a giant canister set. It's called the granary. And behind that is a little three foot space called the cataluma, the guest room. Okay. And the reason that guest room is, exists is because the rabbis who run this observant Jewish culture have said, no married Jewish man can ever sleep in the same room with another man's wife. But you've got mandatory hospitality, you've got your clan coming for the major festivals when they travel to Jerusalem, okay? So you gotta have this little guest room. It's walled off, a section of the, yeah, the regular it's, room it's just separated. walled off. Okay. Yep, almost the floor to ceiling uh, kind of separation. Huh. Now, most of these homes are constructed in at least a hundred different ways. A German archaeologist in the late 1800s actually made drawings of all these one-room homes. There's, it's not one size fits all, but if we put a composite together, there's a half basement underneath this house where either the sheep or the goats, but certainly not both, are kept at night along with the chickens. No cows, <laughs> no horses, okay? Aww. In the heat, 
In the wintertime, convection heating goes up and it helps to warm the place up, okay? Okay. So you got this picture. Ooh, the odor. So, <laughs> while they were there, Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem and the clan observes a very pregnant showing Mary. What do you think their first question is? Who's the father? No. How was the wedding feast? Oh. Because oh. that's, that's true. That would be a wedding for... feast, okay? Uh -huh. And they weren't invited because they're family. They weren't invited. Uh -huh. uh, probably wouldn't have been so. because of the distance here. But Joseph, very uh, stutteringly, uh, well, the truth of the, I uh, mean, there wasn't a wedding feast. Boom. What do you think the conclusion is? Promis promiscuity or adultery, right? But he's Shame. there. Shame. Therefore, I can't let you into my cataluma because I don't want to ritually make my house impure. Oh, and that's why there's no I got a whole no protocol to cleanse my house, and I'm not into that, okay? Now, we think there's roughly 2,000 people in Bethlehem at this point in time. If we have six people per family, we've got 300 homes, 300 catalumas, 300 guest rooms. Why are all of them off limits? when hospitality is mandatory, especially to a member of your own clan. Perception of shame. See, I always thought it was just because of everybody traveling for the census that they just filled up. But even if they weren't filled up because she was pregnant, they wouldn't let her in. Correct. And they stuck her with the animals. And so I think some kind man oh. said, you know, look, you know, I can't let you into my Cataluma, but I tell you what, you can go downstairs in the half basement and be with the sheep and the chickens. And that's where a manger would be. That's where a manger would be. And I want to make a point about that to show you how context is so important. I grew up in the church, so I grew up studying this from the time I was born, hearing these stories. I was probably 25 years old before I came to an understanding of what the word manger meant. I thought when it said he was born in a manger that that was a place where they kept animals like a barn. I didn't know it was a feeding trough. <laughs> I thought the manger was the name for the barn. Yeah, and it's not a wooden thing with cross legs either. Yeah, so it just, you know. What would it be then, a stone basin? In, in the north, it would be from, made from hewn limestone. Okay. In the south, where we have different geology here, it probably would be made from straw and clay. Because you go to the Church of Nativity and they have a stone one that's all, is it a marble? I mean, it's all super fancy and it, that clearly wasn't the case. Yeah, and only the yeah. poorest of the poor would use such a thing okay. in such a place. We need to move on rapidly here if we're going to get any more covered. So, let's All right. Let's pick up from there. Now, there were shepherds nearby living out in a field at night, keeping watch over their flocks, okay? Luke would want us to say, whoa, wait a minute. Why are sheep out in the fields at night? They should be in sheep pens for protection. It's That's December, right. right? It's cold. It's freezing. Well, the reason, one of the reasons they're in the fields is if it's birthing season. Oh, which okay. would not be December. Though. There are two birthing seasons, uh, late April, and then there's a secondary birthing season, the end of June, early July. Okay, just file that away. Hmm. And they were in their fields at night. Now, when we read Josephus, we find out that temple flocks are kept as far south around Greater Jerusalem, as far south as Bethlehem. There's a strong suspicion here. These are temple shepherds, and these are temple sheep, and they're giving birth to Paschal lambs. There you go. And a Paschal lamb is a... A lamb that's destined to be sacrificed at Passover. So Jesus was born when the lambs were getting ready to be sacrificed. Could be. Okay. But we can say for sure that these shepherds and these flocks, the purpose of which is to produce Paschal lambs, depending on the time of year here, and that's the scene that the perfect Paschal lamb was born. Very fitting. Very fitting. And so the shepherds are told... Uh, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloths and lying in a manger. Well, this word manger now is extremely important because shepherds, unlike Psalm 23, are not romanticized in the first century. In fact, they're despised. Okay? Some of the rabbis have said they can never be forgiven because as they travel across fields that they don't own, eating grass that they don't own, they're stealing somebody's grass. They couldn't even be a t uh, give a testimony in court, could they? In a Jewish court of law, they're forbidden. No, no one would trust the shepherd. So they were just outcasts, sort of. They were marginalized. They were on the outside looking in. They might as well have been the equivalent of prostitutes. And yet God okay? uses them to make this <laughs> tremendous declaration. These are shameful shepherds. Now, I want to get you to feel this, this motif of shame is just building here, okay? How did Jesus die? Yeah. On a shameful Roman cross. That's right. What did he do for a ministry? He lifted people out of shame. I mean, this whole scene may stink 
have a stench from the perspective of the Davidic clan, but from heaven's perspective, this is glorious, mm. this motif of shame. It's what he did for people. Okay? So anyway, these shepherds are shameful shepherds. They're on the outside looking in. Everywhere they go, no one will give them the time of day. And so this word manger is a very important word. Say, hey, wait a minute. These people are so poor. They're so unassuming that they're putting their baby in a manger. They're our kind of, our kind of people. Kind of people right. <laughs> They'll actually receive us if we show up, you know? Good point. So it's a great word there. It's a key word that gets them there. Now we continue along here. Suddenly a vast heavenly army appeared oh. with the angel praising God and saying, and my first reaction is, what is the word army there? Yeah, That's a military I've always wondered word. how many. Yeah, well, and vast. Now, how big is vast? Does this mean all the angels in heaven? Or is this just the varsity? Yeah. <laughs> the best singers. Or even yeah. if it was the varsity, were there tryouts? Because this is, this is the <laughs> one event that whole creation has been pointed towards, okay? Did they sing or did they chant? Was this a melodic kind of thing? Did they have to practice? Or, or is practice not necessary in heaven because everything's perfect? I mean, a whole series of questions start to come to mind here. Mm -hmm. But the key word for me now is army. Obviously, they're, they're, they're there to praise. But I would also suggest they're, now, they're there to protect. Oh. There's somebody else who knows that this massive invasion of grace is starting to unfold. Okay? It's God's adversary. And he is determined to mess up everything God tries to do, okay? And so I would suggest these angels are on guard duty as well, saying, this is sacred ground tonight. Don't mess with it, okay? And if you do, there will be consequences. A vast heavenly army arrives on the scene. Wow. Yeah, isn't that fantastic? I've always wondered if angels are... We just don't can't see them. Like maybe the multitude was there, but then their eyes were open to be able to see them, or did they arrive? If we had those eyes, what would we see today? I have no idea. Yeah. But it just raises all sorts of issues. Were they in concert formation on the ground, or were they <laughs> hovering in the air? Did they have a director, you know, when they did this kind of thing? That's really getting into the context. What about their message there? Oh, their message is 14. one of praise. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, shalom amongst people with whom God is pleased. Let's just deal with the word shalom, which we translate as peace here. To the Jewish worldview, shalom means four things, all at the same time. It means reconciliation with God, reconciliation with the community. The community is always more important than the individual in Judaism, in the Hebrew worldview. You're reconciled with yourself and you're reconciled with God's creation. There actually is the theology of ecology in the Hebrew understanding of shalom. And this is a cord woven together of four strands of a rope. The Western people come along and say, oh, well, let's just take this part. Let's just take this part and you know, put it under the microscope. And then you lose the impact of the power of that Jewish word shalom. Hmm. Beautiful. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. And then the angels left them and went back to heaven and the shepherds went to Bethlehem. And if we pick it up um, in verse 20, for all that they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. Who do you think the shepherds told this good news to? Other shepherds. Who are shameful people. Shameful people. Or prostitutes who are shameful people. The one thing, they're not going to go to Temple Mount and tell it to the <laughs> chief priest and the high priest. They're not going to go to the Sanhedrin and tell them. They're not going to go to any rabbi and tell them. They're persona non grata. The good news of the birth of Jesus Christ was propagated from one shameful person to another. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and our discussion with Doug Greenwald about the context of Luke chapter 2. All right, Doug, we've covered Luke chapter 2. Please tell us then, what is the main idea we can get out of that chapter? Well, two things strike me. Uh, one is, this is a manifestation of an amazing invasion of God's grace, okay? For a plan that was set in motion before creation even began. And it answers the Adamic riddle, Ad, uh, Adam, okay? okay? When Adam gets cast out of the garden, and if God had said to him, Adam, how do you think I'm going to fix this mess that you just created? Okay? He never would have thought of a baby in a manger in Bethlehem with shameful shepherds 
Never in a thousand years. You said that word a lot, shame, shame, shame. That's for me is the second motif that's okay. so glorious about the birth of Jesus, how God uses shame, people who are shamed by the culture and incorporates them into his kingdom plan. Wow. Well, Doug, we don't have much time left, but I want to ask you one last question here, and that is, when do you think these events took place? Summer, fall, or winter? Well, I think when Luke gives us the clue, now shepherds were out in the fields at night keeping guard over their flock. They would never be allowed to do that unless the wheat harvest was complete. Yes. The wheat growing actually takes place around Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Right. Okay? And so if they were in the fields before the harvest, they would trample the crop and lower the yield. <laughs> but once the harvest is done, they're encouraged to be in the fields because their byproducts, their human waste, is fertilizer for the next season they're growing. Okay. So we know it's at least end of June, early July. Okay. Okay. The one thing we know it never would be December because if you had an electiveness with any time within a year or two to go register, you'd never pick midwinter okay. to do it. What about the view that it probably was in the fall around the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, that clue comes out of Luke 1 okay. when we deal with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And if we, we read in the Mishnah, we know when Zechariah's clan did their weekly service at the temple in Jerusalem. If we assume he immediately went home and conceived with Elizabeth, and then we add six months to that okay. for the difference between Jesus and John, we can get pretty much close to October 1st, and for some people that puts it in the Feast of Tabernacles. So you're saying that it's either late summer or it's in the fall, but you're saying it's definitely not in December. It'd almost be impossible. No one in their right mind would want to electively travel to Bethlehem <laughs> along the Central Even Ridge in, Israel. in the oh, winter. <laughs> That's our program for this week. I. I've just been so blessed by Doug and his ministry, and we pray God will continue to bless you in that ministry. That's our program. Till we, this time next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. How did people live in the time of Jesus? The DVD set, Life in Bible Times, will help you understand biblical stories and gain knowledge about the culture of the time. This one hour and 45 minute video album contains four television programs on two DVD discs. The first program features agricultural techniques. The second program tells the importance of city gates both for external defense and for internal governance. The third program is about the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples and how the actual event was very different from the famous portrayal painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The fourth program concerns crucifixion and burial customs. The album also contains bonus footage that was not included in the four television programs. All the programs feature the anointed teaching of Dr. Jim Fleming. You can get a copy of the album for a donation of $20 or more. That includes the cost of shipping. To order, call the number you see on the screen or order online at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.